sessions we have at the Asia PVC Summit this morning. And I'm joined by two best place panelists to talk about the LP allocation to Asia Pacific and what has changed. Uh, so I'm joined by uh, Jay Gong, partner Pantheon Ventures and Andy Wong, uh, partner Primary Investments, Adam Street Partners. Let me just take a minute to introduce uh, the two panelists. Uh, Jay Gong is a partner at Pantheon, a global private equity infrastructure and private debt investment firm with uh, 55 billion um, and uh, assets under management. Uh, she is on the Asian um, Regional Investment Committee and Global Co-Investment Committee um, of Pantheon. She's also the vice chairman of the Hong Kong Venture Capital and Private Equity Association. Um, Moving to Andy, he's a partner at, of Adam Street Partners uh, based in the Beijing office. He mainly focuses on primary fund investments and also direct co-investments in China. Before joining Adam Street, Andy worked at uh, CACC and GIC and also in the Asian private equity space. Uh, to both my panelists, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, welcome and great to have you um, with us this morning. We have about 40 minutes. So I want to start with some really uh, big picture questions. Um, and this is to both of you. You know, both of you can uh, take it because that's, uh, let's start with the biggest news around today. Um, the U.S. elections and a Joe Biden victory. Um, as well as that's one. The second thing is the pandemic. These are the two biggest issues that we have that we face today. Uh, on both of these factors, um, do you think LP allocations to Asia, uh, have there been any change due to both of these factors? Um, either of you can go first. Um, Jay, you want to go first? Yeah, I can go first. I think the, um, the, the recent Biden wing is likely to uh, create a period of relative uh, calm. Uh, having said that, um, private equity asset allocation is a very long-term decision. And uh, even when the geopolitical risk was uh, ratcheting up earlier in the year, um, the allocation to Asia has not really changed much from our uh, observation because uh, allocating to Asia is a statement about Asian superior growth trajectory. Um, and uh, also private equity in Asia, as well as venture capital focus on the non-export sectors, on domestic consumption, and those are enduring multi-decade development that are not really swayed by the, um, the, the type of uh, 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 confrontation or escalation of tension we have, uh, have seen. Therefore, I think uh, the, the long-term allocation to Asia uh, is not necessarily dictated by the, you know, the periodical change in the, in the temperature, even though those are still very material development to watch. Regarding pandemic, uh, the recent news from Pfizer certainly lift up our hearts. Uh, there's the light end of a, a tunnel of 2020 uh, to, to really see uh, um, the, the vaccine putting an end to the various lockdowns uh, that we're witnessing in, in some time uh, 2021. Uh, from a practical point of view, uh, within China, business has resumed normalcy pretty much 90-95%, uh, including travel, transportation. Um, but certainly the connectivity with the outside world will resume once the vaccine puts an end to the, the, the travel, you know, the travel inconveniences. Yeah. Andy, how do you see it? Both the Biden presidency uh, yeah. and, and also the pandemic. Yeah, I think I largely agree with uh, what Jay just said. And, you know, the election, uh, no matter what the result, it, 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 it should not impact our investment strategy in Asia, if at all. The uh, overall sentiment uh, should be slightly more positive, uh, especially on the China-US um, relationship and the uh, geopolitical risks, right? Um, in, some, in terms of pandemic, I think probably there, there should be a bigger positive on Asia. Uh, because, you know, overall, the Asian countries uh, have done a better job in terms of controlling the COVID, particularly in China. I'm based here on the ground. So we see, you know, much faster economic recovery, you know, uh, business going back to normal, strong growth of both manufacturing, industrial activities, as well as, uh, you know, rebound export orders as well. 
Um, so we remain uh, very positive on the opportunity set in Asia, and we see a lot of uh, you know uh, of our clients and the peer LPs are increasing their interest in Asia, particularly in you know healthcare in general, for example, as well as you know China ventures. Well, Andy, just continuing on that front, how do you what's your outlook for two thousand twenty one? Yeah, we think it, it will be an interesting vintage year. Um, there are a few things. One is, you know, the PE landscape uh, has experienced a shakeup after, you know, this year. So there's a trend of, you know, bifurca bifurcation and uh, flight to quality in general that we observe. Um, top tier funds and companies are attracting disproportionate uh, amount of capital and, uh, you know, selection and access are becoming even more important uh, going forward. Uh, so in terms of opportunity in the short term, we, we still think, you know, there will be volatilities and challenges. Um, you know, we, we see the back and forth in COVID, you know, sh shutdowns of uh, economic activities. So we re remain a little bit cautious. So we expect to see some, you know, shooting stick and uh, dislocation investments. Um, secondaries, um, for example, late primary privatization deals uh, will continue uh, in the short term. In the long term, Mid to long term, we think you know growth and innovation will uh, continue to drive the you know uh, uh, investment opportunity uh, opportunities in Asia, uh, particularly in tech and healthcare. These re remain very attractive themes. Um, and overall, the capital supply and demand and market competition uh, looks pretty interesting and favorable. Um, so, 2021 we expect it to be a pretty interesting vintage year overall. Sure. Uh, Jay, I just want to take one point that the interesting point that Andy mentioned, which is the flight to quality. Uh, how do you see that in terms of as an LP? In terms of how do you um, do you think that um, LPs with a sorry GPs with a certain kind of a track record or GPs that who have been uh, who've done multiple funds before? So how what what what's the whole uh, criteria to determine uh, flight uh, uh, to quality? Yeah, any crisis, including a public health crisis, certainly puts caution on most people's uh, mind. And with that mindset, uh, um, flight quality is quite pronounced this year. We see, you know, investment activities this year um, remain, uh, it becomes a, a function of the fundraising activity, which is, uh, is fairly robust, but uh, certainly muted compared with uh, last year. Um, fundraising is still easy for GPs who have had uh, exceptional track record, realized track record uh, with very distinct uh, specialization, which has yielded demonstrable um, performance result, uh, as well as uh, you know, those with very strong brand and that uh, symbolizes stability and, uh, and a very safe pair of hands uh, with consistent long track record. But um, for the rest of the LP GPs, it's a more um, prolonged period of fundraising and with more difficulty given the, the lack of ability to do their roadshows. Uh, so definitely there's flight of quality going on and the overall capital constraints um, that's put on the market given the pandemic um, makes the valuation more compelling uh, than last year. We have seen um, those, those GPs that have the dry powder having a great time investing in companies that are coming out to fundraise just to buy insurance to, to get more cash on their balance sheet in the, you know, in the, in the defensive mode. And they're able to get into those companies at very attractive valuations. Got it. And on the same team, how do you evaluate uh, GPs? Because uh, today there are a lot of GPs to choose from. Uh, many of them do sector-specific deals, country-specific, all sorts of categories. So, what's your uh, evaluation criteria uh, that that you that you employ? Yeah, so I, I think Jay mentioned some of the metrics, right? Uh, you know, track record, you know, capabilities, you know, market reputation. Um, I think besides of these, uh, uh, George, as you mentioned, that there are so many of them, right? Uh, one thing is, you know, for them to differentiate. So we look for a differentiation, um, how they stand out, you know, uh, in terms of, you know, strategy, portfolio construction, their deal access or their value add approach, because, uh, you know, capital has become a commodity nowadays. So you need to de demonstrate your differentiation. Um, second thing that I think, you know, is getting uh, a little bit more pronounced nowadays uh, is, uh, you know, specialization. 
Um, this is a very obvious, uh, you know, in the healthcare sector, right? Um, because this is a highly specialized, you know, area. So we need fund managers that, you know, have uh, the domain expertise, experience as, uh, as well as the technical skills um, to, to apply on the deals and to, to generate uh, uh, investment returns. Um, another example is early stage venture, right? Um, also, you know, the judgment on people, not just on business. And, uh, you know, um, it's also a pretty specialized uh, skill set. Um, buyout to some extent as well. It's uh, relatively nascent in some of the emerging markets in Asia. So not many fund managers have a proven capability of uh, doing buyouts in Asia. So if um, some of them can, you know, prove their specialization or differentiation in some of the, these areas, uh, I think, you know, the probe will stand out, uh, you know, among their peers. Got it. Very interesting. I'll come back to some of these uh, points that you mentioned a uh, little later, but I just want to touch, before we move on, I just want to touch one more big picture point, which is uh, we started off with the, the US-China Biden presidency, but outside the US-China uh, tensions, what is, broadly, if you look at it, uh, what has changed in terms of LP allocation to uh, Asia-Pacific? Is it um, the robust uh, exit market that we have in this part of the world, especially in China? that's paving a way for a lot of investors to cash out uh, profitability through trail sales and IPOs because we've never seen such a strong uh, IPO pipeline in the recent past. Uh, Jay, you want to take this uh, in terms of the, the whole exit environment? That's like a big change when it comes to Asia. Yeah, um, I think the growth uh, differential between you know Asia and uh, much of the developing Asia and uh, the the US and European market become quite pronounced in a year like this. Um, so that is one area that in a low interest rate environment provides a lot of uh, attraction for LPs uh, to think about uh, putting their capital where the growth is more, more interesting. Um, and the other characteristics is uh, the um, you know, valuation, as I mentioned, uh, the valuation between China in particular and uh, the US, I'm just picking an example, uh, was in previous years um, quite, uh, there's quite a large gap um, between US has been on an ascendant trend uh, with quite high valuation and that there's um, certainly more depressed level valuation uh, in China across many sectors. Of course, there are always pockets of overheating and high valuation, but by, by and large, more attractive. And this year, because the fundraising uh, becomes more challenged for the vast majority of the GPs here, um, there are just even better valuation to be had. So that is also a, a strong draw uh, for LPs who can see that uh, this is a very good vintage. And uh, the exit environment that you have mentioned um, was a vindication that capital has traveled full cycle uh, and DPI in this region can prove out to be very attractive. Uh, mind you, the, the strong exit environment is not all prevailing, i.e. it's not, it's actually quite uneven between the different uh, sectors. I would say themes of innovation, themes of technology enabled transformation, whether it's business model or otherwise, uh, have certainly gained further favor as the, the economy uh, is in a way catapulted into a higher land or higher plane of uh, digitalization by the pandemic. Uh, healthcare likewise has enjoyed uh, much stronger policy support as well as uh, attention um, as, a, as a very favored sector, even though in the last several months it has seen valuation becoming a bit more, uh, you know, coming down a bit in, as uh, many, many public companies, investors take profit. So there are a number of areas that have gained significantly uh, in their relative positioning uh, in this year's uh, pandemic, as well as the, the aft uh, the world that, that has emerged out of it. Got it. Um, Andy, um, when you speak, when you look at exits, uh, it's not just IPOs alone, but the way the, but overall the way that the markets have been performing, uh, does that also give a secondary market, uh, you, you had mentioned secondaries earlier, so does that also give secondary market a boost, a huge boost? 
Yeah, I think, you know, probably this cuts both ways. Um, if the, the IPO and the exits, uh, you know, for uh, the primary funds, it's easier, right? Um, and um, I'm not sure that will boost secondary, uh, uh, you know, activities uh, uh, because, you know, um, instead of uh, staying private for longer, a lot of the, you know, Asian and Chinese companies are actually seeking for uh, liquidity events, uh, you know, in terms of IPO a little bit earlier. Um, it's less than uh, liquidity um, events for them, but more financing them. And, um, but you see, you know, it, it provides a, a route for in the funds to get liquidity. So uh, in, in terms of that, so uh, there's probably less demand for secondaries. But on the other hand, for secondary investments, this provides you know much better visibility in terms of the, you know their underwriting, their pricing, and, and modeling in terms of the underlying assets and you know uh, future exits, right? Um, so I think overall it should be helpful um, for the private equity market, uh, the overall liquidity, the overall exit, uh, you know, uh, prospect, uh, as well as uh, you know, um, uh, for secondaries uh, to participate in this, uh, you know, overall uh, industry. Got it, uh, Jay. Uh, you spoke about a couple of sectors, like including healthcare, that has been uh, a lot of interest. Uh, but out, uh, what are the other sectors that do you think are underinvested in? Um, and that can absorb significant amounts of capital? Um, there are quite a lot of sectors within the broader TMT area, and I would be careful not to label them as technology, because I think these days uh, technology permeates all the industries uh, across different industries. Uh, it's a basic capability like oxygen to a business, so this is not a nice to have or this is not tech versus non-tech. Um, everything needs to have that in order to not only to, 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 to basically survive in this environment. Um, so I would be, be loath to create the misconception that it's all about technology, it's not. With that caveat, I would say their acute need for businesses to operate um, efficiently both cost effectively as well as uh, uh, without the vulnerability or the susceptibility of disruption in this environment. And therefore, we see a lot of uh, tech enabled innovation in reducing the intermediaries of the supply chain uh, to ensure um, the robustness of uh, uninterrupted, uh, or, or should I say, defensibility of the, the supply chain. Uh, we see logistics uh, going through also a lot of uh, consolidation as well as improvement of efficiency to lower down the cost. And uh, that is uh, part of doing business for company, companies on different parts of that chain. Um, so a lot of efforts are going to helping enterprises to improve their effectiveness. Um, enterprises uh, had a shock during the uh, the general COVID lockdown early in the spring because they suddenly realized that uh, their vulnerabilities were, were out in the open and uh, they need to rely on technology to help them uh, deal with crises like this more effectively. So wow. in a way, they become willing paying customers for whether it's software, whether it's other types of business services that actually help create this um, this strength in their chain to make them more uh, more resilient. Got it. But yeah, I have a I have a related question uh, uh, for, uh, with regard to technology for you. Uh, with, when you look at most of the GPs, do you think that there's an overweight of uh, tech deals? You know, is that becoming a challenge for LPs because? The way tech has been performing, everybody, uh, whether they have uh, specialization or not, all the GPs are rushing into diversification. They all want to do tech. Yeah, I think that was where I, I, I was thinking uh, when I made that caveat. I think that the, in terms of pure tech deals, the allocation is not uh, excessive by any stretch. Um, but there are many companies that have used technology and adopted in a very productive way. I wouldn't label those as... Um, as tech companies, for example, a consumer companies that use internet uh, and mobile as, as their sole distribution channel. In my book, that's not a technology company because the core of it is a, cons is a consumer company. So you need to make that distinction as to a pure play technology company versus a company that's just empowered by digitalization. Understood, yeah, makes sense, yes. 
Uh, Andy, uh, before I move on to, I just want to sort of ask you on where you think uh, it came up a couple of times in the in the discussion earlier. But where do you think uh, valuations stand today? Um, and a broader issue on valuations when you look at Asia, because we're looking look, uh, discussing Asia. Uh, when you look at Asia, many of the markets, especially China, uh, which is seeing a faster adoption adoption of tech, which is seeing uh, growth when most of the rest of the world is not. uh therefore is asia justified in having a premium uh, over similar sectors similar companies in other parts of the world in terms of valuations yeah that's a very good question i think i think it depends um you know in terms of consumer companies i i think you absolutely right right um asia and china has this uh you know big advantage of a you know large domestic market um and uh, given a technology that uh, you know can uh, disrupt some of the business models that you have a very strong network effect so the companies can grow and you know very fast and uh, generate uh, uh, huge uh, you know uh, companies in the consumer um and the technology you know cross sections right you you have seen these in the e-commerce e-commerce sector you know various companies right online gaming online education and online you know consumer companies more recently right? the the online cosmetics uh, company that was listed uh, recently so many companies we saw that you know they grew from literally zero to multi billion dollars within you know 3 to 5 years that's the you know uh, the strong momentum that, that uh, you talked about so from this perspective i think you know uh, some of these uh, companies uh, do merit uh, you know a, a valuation premium uh compared to the peers in 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 the US and Europe uh just because of the the growth and the, the large potential that they can generate um and uh, you see that in the public market right yeah um, and the public investors are also you know buying into these uh, stories um but on the other hand not every sector and every company can pull this uh, you know off um so for example enterprises um you know the US SaaS companies are actually trading at very high valuations nowadays yes. but uh on the other hand the enterprise ecosystem in in china i think it's lagging a little bit in terms of the scaling and the monetization it's even a little bit uh, you know slower than uh, india um so we see that the valuation premium here is probably not justified um in terms of overall you know valuation level you know i think this year the tech and healthcare sectors attracted a lot of interest so there's uh, you know um the valuation level is elevated and uh, there's probably some forthness so we're getting a little bit cautious towards uh, you know especially the late stage uh, deals uh, in in these sectors uh, so we want to move to a little bit earlier stage you know better value um and uh, you know better risk adjusted returns but uh, so jay do you see a lot more of this happening because andy mentioned about uh, late stage valuations and as late stage valuations continue to rise do you see a possibility of more gps trying to get into deals early you know maybe do uh, smaller check sizes uh but the catch is early stage investing requires a, it's a completely different ball game it requires a completely different expertise how do you see it yeah i think the late stage certainly has a uh, a lower entry barrier and therefore there are many generalists who playing it their hedge funds doing cross crossover rounds before ipo it's a it's a fairly crowded space um but i would also say that the early stage um The, the the there are many players but the skilled players are, are quite limited because people with experience who are able to who entrepreneur with very strong reference list of their signature deals that cohort is still quite limited in number and therefore you know there are many people doing it but those that are institutional quality that are, are backable from a a a, a Uh, our perspective is still quite a limited uh, number uh, and i would imagine you know putting ourselves in the shoes of part, uh, of the entrepreneurs they would make the same evaluation and judgment as to who they want to to have their journey with and they would pick those have experience in helping company going from good to great and uh, help them ipo um so um whilst there are a lot of uh, players in the um uh, you know it looks like a very picked over field uh, those that actually have differentiation and uh, any distinction is uh, is still quite limited got it 
Uh, and Andy, how do you see this? You see this? I'm asking because uh, Adam Street uh, Partners has been bullish on GPs that do early stage. How do you evaluate uh, these GPs? Because early stage evaluation is much, much. Uh, uh, it's difficult to have a track record. You know, how do you sort of uh, figure out which GPs to go with in this in uh, when it comes to early stage? Sure. Yeah, I, I think that's a, a good point. And you know, ultimately, it's a people business. So we think you know that network. Uh, with uh, the GPs and the market intel is very important. Um, you know, it's good that, you know, Adam Street actually has been investing in Asia since 2004, a very long history. So we know a lot of these uh, GPs uh, individually, you know, as well as institutionally for a long time. So it's very helpful uh, to understand their capabilities, uh, track record, and even their personalities and the team culture through many years of interactions, right? Um, so... And it's not just the more established, you know, venture franchises, because now we see far more, you know, new managers and spin outs, um, you know, from established firms. Um, although a lot of them are first time funds, but not first time teams. So it's also important that, you know, we know them from their prior firms um, uh, and as individuals and as investors uh, to apply on their you know, capabilities. Got it. Uh, and if you look at uh, a big picture view of, um from the LP's uh, uh, perspective. Uh, uh, Jay, how do you think um, in terms of capital allocation towards Asia, where do you see a bulk of it go to? Yeah, it's uh, Asia is really a collection of very, very different economies and markets. So I think the if you look at the, cap the capital weighting by transaction volume, I would say, um, probably 55% to 60% um, going to China um, and uh, developed Asia like Australia, Japan and Korea also um, garner quite a, a large chunk of the, the capital. Um, and then, you know, Southeast Asia and India um, are, are also areas that people allocate capital. So it's going to be really a composite of uh, allocations to those different destinations. And in each destination, um, the playbook being very different in where uh, the, the stronger, the, the most compelling opportunity set is. Got it. Uh, Andy, how do you, uh, well, what about it for uh, Adam Street Partners? Because if I'm not mistaken, your Asia accounts for only about 15% of your total outlay. Do you see this going up over the next couple of years? Sure, yeah. I, I cannot comment on our specific allocation, but, you know, in general, we're very positive on the opportunities in Asia. Um, you know, not just on primary fund investments, right? Um, uh, but in terms of primary fund investments, we have been very busy this year, and, you know, in, in terms of uh, both re-upping uh, existing fund managers as well as uh, scouting for new relationships. Um, but we're also seeing a, a lot of, uh, you know, interesting opportunities uh, in uh, direct co-investments as well. Uh, this year probably is a, is a historical year for us in terms of the number of deals and the, uh, the amount of money we put out in Asia in terms of co-investments. Um, besides the investment activities, we also see very good, uh, you know, distribution and liquidity. Um, the number of IPOs in our, you know, underlying portfolio is amazing this year. And uh, the, uh, the amount of uh, liquidity and distribution that we generated from Asia is also very, very encouraging. I think the ma market has uh, been uh, maturing uh, in Asia and uh, you, know, you see sizable companies that you can deploy capital, uh, high quality managers um, and the depth of the market, I think it's uh, pretty right uh, for you know, increasing allocation. Got it. As, as the market matures, you talked about Asia market maturing. Uh, Jay, in, as the market matures, uh, capital almost becomes like a commodity. Uh, so therefore, what are we, What as LPs, what are you looking for in GPs beyond just capital? Is it the strength of the team? It is, is it specialization? Is it performance? What are you look, really looking at? It's all these things. <laughs> I think uh, performance is a, a very strong indicator of their underlying differentiation and resources. I think it's all about being able to provide some value to the G to the entrepreneur that they find difficult to replicate elsewhere. Um, entrepreneurism can be a pretty lonely journey. So to have uh, somebody who can be a coach and advisor and a sounding board, knowing very well how the industry is, knowing very well on how the same industry in other parts of the world have played out. 
um, is quite an essential role to, to step in. And uh, the level of engagement that different GPs have with the founder, operator, entrepreneur is very different. So certainly through reference calls and through just uh, direct engagement with the team, you get a very good sense on what's their level of support to the, to the entrepreneurs. I also think the other is uh, just judgment and business acumen. Uh, all the businesses, you know, have curved walls sometime during their, their journey. How a, uh, how a uh, GP react to that? Uh, what are the times to, to help? What are the times to provide a critical assistance? What are the times to really uh, to insist on, you know, intervening, steering of a, a, a current path? Those are certainly art and not science and require a lot of experience and uh, very, very good judgment. So all those are, are invaluable to an entrepreneur and can make the difference between life and death for the business. Got it. I just want to ask you a related question uh, on that, Jay, in the sense that um, in this context, how do, over the last two, three years, we've seen a lot of uh, fund managers come out of established GPs and venture out on their own. Um, so in this global um, environment, how tough or how is it, where do you see first-time managers? Yeah, I think first-time managers uh, can have a uh, hundred shades of uh, um, you know, differences. The key is, you know, how strong their track record was in their prior prep platform. There are first time managers that are what renowned figures in the space they operate in have over a decade of uh, proven track record, uh, very strong attribution, and they can still, they can raise fund, their first fund in a heartbeat and get oversubscribed. And there are other first time managers that are first-time investors. They may not have uh, raised or managed uh, institutional capital before, and uh, their fate is distinctly different from, from the other group. Um, it's very diff difficult to, to generalize it, but I think one area that's uh, quite clear is they generally require quite a lot of LP assistance in becoming a manager um, with all the foundation of fund, sound fund management, um, building the, the blocks of the necessary uh, resources and tools to run a asset management business. And this is an area that we can add a lot of value by transferring knowledge in that regard. Got it. Uh, we just looked at first time uh, managers, uh, how they're faring. What about, Andy, what about uh, mid-market funds? Uh, because as GPs grow bigger and bigger in size, uh, many of the mid-market funds are competing with regional funds, global funds, how do you see them? Yeah, I think there, there should be a space for, for them, um, you know, as the industry getting more and more specialized, uh, you know, uh, and there are different segments of, uh, you know, deals or, you know, uh, markets for different managers to play, right? Um, I think there's still opportunities in both um, growth equity as well as buyouts in the mid market in, in Asia. Uh, we have seen this in the in the developed markets uh, as well, right? In the U.S. and Europe, even nowadays, uh, there are very interesting, very interesting mid market, you know, fund managers uh, which generate uh, very good returns and you know um, can consistently deploy and and uh, continue with their strategy. So we do think there's some merit in that. But actually, you know, um, for them to do that, they need to find their own angle and the value propositions, right? As you mentioned, you know, competition is uh, fierce. Um, and, uh, you know, they need to differentiate uh, from the, you know, bigger global funds, you know, either, you know, their, uh, you know, special deal angles or, you know, their understanding of the sectors or their network with some of the smaller, you know, companies in terms of the relationship and, uh, you know, their value add. So um, if they do it well, we think it's very interesting because, you know, they have better opportunities in finding less covered deals in the mid market and also better opportunities of upselling to a larger, larger funds. Uh, so that we, we, we think, you know, some of these are interesting. Another trend that I, I want to share is that, you know, we observed that in, in the early stage, you know, venture firms um, in China, in, in, in Asia, they're also getting bigger and uh, raising more growth stage capital, uh, you know, becoming food stack, right? Similar to what's happening in the Silicon Valley. Uh, so in a sense, you know, these funds, you know, a lot of these funds are over 1 billion already. 
Um, they also are, you know, in a sense, uh, mid market funds, um, but you know, um, earlier stage, uh, you know, uh, growth as well. Understood. And I just want to stick with you to ask you a related question. You talked about uh, growth funds. Uh, uh, we talked about mid market. Uh, uh, just in that context, you know, as as many of uh, as today as many of the growth funds today, they must have started off as um, early stage funds, and the fund sizes became bigger and bigger. Um, many VCs, especially in China, are raising billion dollar plus funds, uh, and, and they're also all raising larger follow on vehicles. As an LP, I just wanted to understand from you: as fund sizes are growing bigger, um, and um, does it mean uh, does, it does not necessarily have to translate to higher returns, right? In the sense that data shows yeah. um, quite the opposite because uh, some, sometimes the best of returns may come from first-time managers or some of the smaller funds. But as an LP, is there a concern that as GPs grow bigger and bigger that that the, the investment game in many parts of the world, especially in like China, is now also becoming a fee game? Yeah, no, that's a that's a great point. I think in general, you know, fund size is an enemy of uh, returns, um, and uh, but you know, I think good uh, GPs find ways to you know um, um, keep a consistent uh, you know return profile by you know either scaling up their team resources, you know, up uh, their gaming in terms of investment strategy, um, or you know finding different ways to add value to to their portfolio companies so that. Uh, they can still generate uh, the returns. I think this is something probably the the Asian GPs can learn a lot from the you know um, GPs in the developed market. Actually, you know we we bridge a lot for our Asia GPs to speak to our GPs in Silicon Valley in, in, in the US. How you know in terms of organization uh, wise, you know the succession and uh, you know the continuation of the strategy, the motivation of the partners. Um, and then the team culture. How how do how do they ensure that uh, you know the longevity of the the funds as well as the the consistency of the returns can can you know um, can uh, continue. Uh, but this is overall is a, it's a it's a challenge. It's, that's why you know besides the you know more established uh, uh, funds, we we do you know look look out for you know new spin outs, more interesting smaller size uh, funds, uh, which we think you know have, probably have a better potential. In terms of uh, generating in term, but you know, in the, in terms of portfolio construction, I think this is a balance of both. Got it. Uh, Jay, in terms of sticking to returns, uh, how do you see? How do you generate alpha in the era of excess liquidity? Will you see uh, more GPs venture into unknown markets or industries that they're not uh, familiar with because um, capital is available and it's going to be it's getting more and more tougher for GPs to deliver alpha. Yeah, I have seen some GPs venturing out to new geography. Uh, there have been VCs going into India and other parts of uh, Asia to back the Chinese uh, founder-backed enterprises. Those Chinese uh, founders tend to be the alumni of uh, Alibaba, Tencent. They want to replicate the same success model in uh, from China to other parts of the world, you know, some are in the Middle East, some are in South Asia. And uh, we have seen entrepreneurs following the entrepreneurs, sorry, the uh, GPs following entrepreneurs to the different parts of market um, with mixed uh, level of success. I think localization is very important. That's nothing to be taken for granted. Uh, the local adaptation and finding local sponsor who can add necessary resource and value are often what to make or break those uh, small businesses. Um, so we always uh, ask GPs to be cautious and to, um, it doesn't, it's okay to, to, to really wet their toe, but to certainly not a good thing to put a, a large chunk of allocation there. And that has typically been the case that GPs are um, getting their first experience, first deal, cutting their teeth in a different market, but doing so very cautiously and with limited capital. Understood. Yes, uh, we're almost at the end of time. Andy, um, I can just want to ask you something that uh, uh, what uh, uh, Jay said to talk uh, about Chinese entrepreneurs going abroad um, and trying to build out these companies that were successful in China. In the current geopolitical context, uh, do you think this trend will increase a lot more or going forward, how do you see this? Yeah, I think it depends on uh, the regions. 
uh, apparently in cer certain regions, uh, you know, um, uh, the geopolitics, uh, you know, is, is more, <laughs> It's more serious, so I think you know it, it's um, there's definitely headwinds for Chinese companies, Chinese entrepreneurs. Uh, but you know, in other uh, regions, for example, Southeast Asia, I think you know overall the environment is still pretty friendly, and um, you know the local local you know community or you know entrepreneurs actually welcome the opportunity to collaborate uh, and to learn from the business models uh, in, in China and work with some of the you know like more established firms. Um, but I think, as as Jay mentioned, it's always a delegate um, for you know uh, cross border investments. Uh, so we also, you know, take take caution on this one. Um, and also, you know, um, since we have a Singapore office, you know, have good, good exposure in Southeast Asia. Um, so uh, through investing in local Southeast Asia, you know, um, funds and you know companies is another way to get exposure there. Done. Uh, we're out of time. Just one final question. Uh, yeah, how do you see a market? We are based in Singapore, uh, DCGC Bay headquartered here. Uh, but broadly, if you look at it, uh, how do you see a region like Southeast Asia? Southeast Asia is a, an, a very interesting market. It's a very big market. And recently, you have seen the uh, 15 country agreement uh, of a, a NAFTA sort of a trade agreement, uh, including Southeast Asia. I think all those bode well for more intra-regional uh, transfers of uh, trade, labor, commerce. Um, so I think uh, overall, I'm optimistic that Southeast Asia will be a, an, an area to watch. Um, I think that the key, the key is to, to find the right talent. Uh, it's also relatively talent thin uh, in terms of a, GP experience, uh, investment-based experience. So over time, that should also be enriched by more, more participants in the market. Got it. Uh, Andy, my final question to you is on talent. Uh, how do you see, you know, that's something that is often not talked about. Uh, talent at the LP level, GP level, as GPs expand to other countries, even regions like Southeast Asia, uh, you're going to see intense uh, competition for talent. Many of the smaller GPs won't be able to pay the kind of Pay skills as larger uh, GPs do. Family offices are also now scouting for the same talent. So will that be a big, um, what do you call, a bottleneck for private equity growth in certain parts of the world? Um, no, I think the, the talent market has been competitive, um, but I, I don't think it will be, uh, uh, it, uh, become a bottleneck. Actually, the growth of the private, uh, private equity market in general is attracting more talent to come in, right, uh, from you know, consulting, investment banking, you know, returning from overseas, you know, uh, with experience in, in developed markets. So we see uh, more talents actually uh, going in. But as you pointed out, uh, you know, it's important to have the right system, right? Not just composition, but, you know, team culture, the, you know, the room to do deals um, and, uh, you know, the, the system and the process uh, to, to do, you know, good investments. Uh, it's, it's, it's also you know, these are all important factors to to attract and retain talent. Uh, I think one interesting, uh, you know, trend this year is, you know, the, the competition for healthcare talent has been increasing this year because all the funds, uh, no matter specialized or generous or, or even ventures are, you know, very interesting this year. Um, and um, it, it, it's a good thing for, you know, a lot of uh, these, uh, you know, uh, people with uh, the experience and the background. And, uh, and I, I think overall it should be positive for the industry as well. Got it. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Jay. Thank you, Andy. We've uh, exceeded the time that we had. I'm sorry we couldn't take any of the audience questions, but I can send it to them. But um, in terms of LP, LP perspectives, thank you for joining us. It was a very uh, insightful session, um, and and I'm sure our audience enjoyed listening in to both of you. Thank you again. Thank you, Georgie. Thank you, Andy. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you all.